All right. How's everybody doing today? Like you said, uh, my name is Chris Ryan. We're going to be talking about discrimination training for supervisors. The reason it's a little bit different than the discrimination training for employees is that the employees just kind of get the nuts and bolts of what it needs to be, but the supervisors are the ones that need to understand what is required of them as soon as you find out that this is happening in your work environment. So a little bit about me. I was the county clerk, HR director with the Sumter County Board of Commissioners for about five years. I've been doing this for 14 now. I have a master's degree in business, a bachelor's degree in human resources, and two certifications from the Carl Benson Institute of, of, Institute of Government for, for UGA. I'm a certified county clerk and an advanced certified human resource manager. So we're gonna be talking about discrimination and harassment. And as you know, that is illegal and we've gotta be very careful with what's going on today. Just because it's not really the big issues that are getting us into trouble right now. It's the small things. It is the fact that not what we are doing like physically grabbing somebody or anything like that. It is what we're saying to people now. That's why supervisors especially have to have their eyes and ears open to make sure if they see this, that they stop it as soon as possible. So simply having a policy these days is not enough because a lot of employees don't really read the policies. They got to know what sort of conduct they cannot engage in. They got to know what sort of conduct that they don't have to put up with. And they definitely need to know how to report it. And this is where y'all come in. Training is essential. Training for everybody, part-time, full-time, temporary, even if it comes to commissioners and council members is important because anybody can have a claim filed against them. So as a supervisor, you need to be trained enough to know how to answer these questions. And definitely when it comes to how do I go about reporting it? And the reason I say that is this, this is the one policy that actually will bypass chain of command, which means usually you go to your immediate supervisor, you follow the chain of command. But this one says, if you don't feel comfortable going to that supervisor or your or the department head, you can actually go outside that department or office. Now, it's a little bit unusual to do that in a sheriff's office, but it has happened. A lot of times we usually see that it goes to other people. And we usually say two to three other people is what we recommend. HR, go to the county or city administrator or manager or whatever. I've even seen one policy that went straight to council. That's a little bit different, but it was because it was a smaller entity. But most of the time you have it to where you can go to other people besides the people that are in direct supervision because they may be the ones that are actually doing it to the employee. So the things that make us unique are the things we like to pick on each other about. Are we too tall, too short? Do we wear glasses, do not wear glasses? Are we the youngest or oldest employee? And unfortunately we've heard this many times throughout the day. I wish that old employee would just retire or telling a, a, a gentleman, when are you going to retire? These are questions that you're not supposed to be asking people because it violates its discrimination because of a protected class. And we'll talk about some of these protected classes also. And it can be as simple as this. I usually ask this question. Does anyone out there have nicknames? And there's certain groups that like to have nicknames. And then the question I ask them is this, can you tell me the nicknames? And most of the time, if, if especially a police department, sheriff's office, fire department, or public work says, no, we can't tell you the names, it usually means that it could be illegal and go against some of those protected classes. That's why even as far as like little as nicknames need to be um, looked into also. So, illegal harassment can be based on protected characteristics, sex, age, race, color, disability, handicap, creed, national origin, ancestry, and sexual orientation was added in Georgia June 26, 2020. Now, usually cities and counties already had that in their policy because they knew it was coming, but now it is official that you have to have it in your policy and sexual orientation can be a form of harassment now, illegal harassment. So you gotta remember that. Please make sure you're adding that into your policies. So harassment is a course of conduct directed at a specific person, and it reasonably could cause emotionally distress in such person. It serves as no legitimate purpose. It's usually words, gestures, and action would tend to ignore, alarm, or abuse another person. 
And the reason it is offensive is because it's mistreatment of a protected class. And it's offensive because it's against this and it's against federal law, y'all. If we ever go to court for this, which is very unusual, we'll go before a federal judge and he or she will decide our fate. And that's the last thing you ever want to have happen, especially when it comes to a city or county. You want to make sure that as soon as you know about it as a supervisor, you're stopping what's going on. So when we look at discrimination issues, employment discrimination, we see two different types that we usually have to deal with. It can be intended against a group. That would be like a desperate treatment of a group. An example I usually use is this. So the city or county says that we're going to have to, we're going to offer early retirement this year, but instead of offering it to the people, whether they can take it or not, they're telling the people who must take it. And it's usually the older workers that they're pushing out of the workforce. Yes, that is illegal until it comes to emergency services. And that's a little bit different, but not that much. It could be unintentional, which usually creates a desperate impact of the group. So it was done by mistake or not really thinking who's going to be affected. So the city or county says this, we have to downsize. And in downsizing, what we're going to do is get rid of all administrative assistants. Now, typically, administrative assistants are females. So unintentionally, they may be going against protected class of people when they try to downsize. That's why they have to be so careful on who it's going to impact. Even though it may be unintentional, it's still impacting a protected group. So a couple of acts we actually see. Title VII Civil Rights Act of 64 is enforced and administered by the EEOC. You must have 15 or more employees to, to enact this, uh, this act. That's the federal side. It prohibits discrimination in employment on employment conditions against protected classes. At the time that it first was initiated, it was no individual liability, which meant the city, county, or location, the employer was responsible for any of the employee's actions. Now, the cost was upward, especially with employers with 100 or less employees. It was 50,000 compensatory and 50,000 punitive. Now, however, punitive damages could be imposed on local government, so it's just that first 50 when it comes to compensatory damages, but $50,000 back in 64 was a lot of money. And like I said, employers were solely responsible for what the, their employees did. It also included a retaliation policy, and it says who's protected? So anybody can be protected from employees, former employees, or applicants. That's why I stress to retaliation assessment and discrimination in general. You've got to be very, very careful as a supervisor when you're doing interviews, what type of questions you're asking, who you're asking them to, and stuff like that, making sure you're following the same guidelines. A little bit different, but Title VII includes that anti-retaliation. What conduct is protected? Well, opposing an unlawful action, which is the same thing as whistleblowing, okay, whether it's perceived or real, making a charge of discrimination. It's easier in, in the attorneys will understand it a little bit more if you make a charge of discrimination because it's based on the perception of the person. And then when you do the investigation, you find out that it's not, but making a charge of discrimination, there is a little protection there. Testifying, assisting, or participating in any manner of investigation, charge, or proceeding or hearing. So once they get into that, they are protected a little bit, but they do not have a what we call a magic shield. Employees that participate in harassment complaints think that they are immune to discipline, but they are definitely wrong. Because if you would discipline a normal employee for this action, you can discipline them too. So, but you need to be assured that the actions you are based on legitimate business-based reasons. So if you have any questions, please check with HR on this one. So the changes to the statute in 1983 in the Title VII it was unique to the public sector because now there's individual liability, which means you as a personal person can be charged with this. And that usually helps out because cities and counties are not liable for any of the damages and stuff anymore because the employee has been trained, they have a policy, they implemented the policy and everything. So individual liability is very, very rare real and you've got to make sure employees understand that this could happen and now because of 1983 there's no cap on damages 
That's why we have a lot of these harassment discrimination cases that are billions of dollars. So the good news for the private sector employees, we, it allows for qualified immunity. So now employers are not automatically responsible for the action of the employees unless they haven't done the legal standards of having a policy, training on the policy and everything like that. If you've done that, you should be able to be okay and it probably will go toward the employee itself. So the Pregnancy Discrimination Act in uh, 1978, it was amended and expanded the definition of sexual discrimination that includes this act because of this. What used to happen is a member or an employee would find out that an employee was pregnant, and especially if it was a lady, they would probably fire her because they say, look, we don't know if you're gonna be here every day, you're the primary caregiver, so we don't have, we don't know if you're gonna be here, so we're just gonna let you go. Finally, the court stepped in and said, you can't do that. Now, the Pregnancy Discrimination Act runs concurrent with the Family Medical Leave Act that says while a person is out on either pregnancy, childbirth, related medical conditions of a child, even fostering a child or adoption, this person has the opportunity to be, able to be there for this. And it's even going the male side or the spouse side to be able to have this time off also. Equal Pay Act. Unfortunately, um, this one right here has really bothered me for a while just because I don't understand why it's still around. This is saying that there's different wages in pay for employees just because they are the opposite sex. Where the employees' skills, their effort and responsibility is equal, and the employee has similar working conditions. But the the female employee is being paid less. And usually where I see it the most now is in entry level positions. The lady is being paid below entry level. And my first question is always why? And I always hear this, she's not qualified for the job. Well, just as you know, a lot of the HR people know this too, that as soon as you interview her and hire her, you made her qualified for the job. So that makes no sense whatsoever. And the standard is no longer null and void. So you've got to make sure everybody's being paid equally. Now, some defenses that you can use, of course, seniority. Of course, if somebody's been there longer, they're going to make more money. If they have more merit, maybe more certifications or something like that, that's fine. Qualifications or quantity of production, that's fine. It has to be another factor besides opposite sex. And unfortunately, we still see that happening in today's world. And this needs to stop really quickly also. The enforcement is always upward. Successful complainants recover back pay, liquidated damages, and attorney's fees and costs. And you got to remember, most attorney's fees, if they're coming after a case, it's usually 30 to 40 percent of the winning. So they're coming after the money. So please make sure this is not happening in the work environment. And right now, there's no general individual liability or personal liability. It's all on the employee. And I don't think that's going to change. Discrimination Employee Act, this is Age Discrimination Employee Act. It says if you are over the age of 40, you are now in a protected class, whether you're male or female, okay? It is administered and enforced by the EEOC. You must have 20 or more employees and everybody usually is covered under that. And it's uh, local government employers can maintain mandatory requirement policies, retirement policies for public uh, safety employees. That's also what's been happening. Now, this is subject to the same legal analysis as Title VII claims. It causes the same action for retaliation. You gotta make sure nobody's being retaliated against just because of their age. Like I said, no individual li uh, liability under Age Discrimination Act either. Damages are back pay, front pay, liquidated damages, and attorney's fees. Americans with Disabilities Act, this is a unique one because most of the time, what we need to remember about this one, it is a reasonable accommodation without creating a Hindu hardship. And it's, it by, it's discrimination by employers against qualified individuals with disabilities in virtually all aspects of employment. So what is a reasonable accommodation? And we'll talk about what some reasonable accommodations is. It, it, it is they have the ability to perform the essential functions of a job. And please let the employee request the reasonable accommodation. Because as soon as you assume they are 
disabled, they're disabled, and they can assume that they can make a request in. Have the employee make the reasonable accommodation. So some examples of reasonable accommodation, altering the facility to make it more accessible, handicap parking. Uh, if maybe there's multi-levels of your building and there's no elevator in place, you have to make sure you come down to the first floor to accommodate those that can't make it up the stairs or something like that. Modifying work schedules. A lot of people say, well, you know, that's kind of hard to do because we have to be here at a certain time. But like I said, it's got to be reasonable, of course. Let's say this person says, I can't make it to work at 8. Can you make it 8.30? And you finally say, yes, that's not a problem. Let's go to ahead and make it um, 8.30. So for the next two months, 8.30, they're there. They're there. And after about three months, they start showing up at 8.45, 8.50, and even 9 o'clock. And you got to remember this, you met the reasonable accommodation. So the fact that they're not meeting their end of the reasonable accommodation, they can be disciplined unless they ask for another one. Uh, reassignment to a vacated position is a reasonable accommodation. Providing qualified readers or interpreters, or it could be like a, a voice modification on the phone that maybe amplifies the sound or something on a computer screen that, that amplifies the fonts or something like that, reasonable. Something that's not reasonable, eliminating or changing the essential functions of the job or anything that possesses an undue hardship on the employer, whether in duties of the job or financial hardships or jeopardizes the health of someone else of another employee. Reasonable accommodation I always give is this. There was a gentleman that came back from a worker's comp claim and he was in a wheelchair for a couple more weeks recuperating. So they put him in a light duty position answering phones. Now, the first time he walked into his office, he found out that his wheelchair would not fit up under the desk. So I asked, what would be a reasonable accommodation here? And of course, people say, you know, raise the desk, change the desk, buy him a different desk, all good, good things. But his request was a $30,000 desk that when he comes in, he pushes a button, it raises, he pushes the button, and it lowers back down on top of him due to hydraulics. Now that was a $30,000 desk. That's probably not reasonable for a city or county to do. Uh, Fortune 500 company, probably so. And there was even one person and I told them, please don't do this. They actually said, to just let the air out of his tires in the wheelchair. That's a whole different issue and let's not get into that one, okay? So supervisors have always been the key to successful implementation of any type of policy and especially an anti-harassment policy. Because if you stand behind it and you enforce it, everybody below you, your subordinates, will see that it's important also. You wanna make sure that you're training on it on a routine basis. And it could be as simple as just going over the policy, having them sign a sheet saying they've read it, they understand it, they have no questions about it. But you're going over the policy and even if you need to bring HR into that department or office to kind of help you out with it. What you're doing is you're making sure that they have no questions about this type of this, this type of policy on what the do's and don'ts are. How can you tell if behavior is inappropriate? You always ask this question, would you want it to show up in the newspaper? Is there equal power? So is it two supervisors arguing or is it a supervisor subordinate arguing that can lead into a hostile work environment? Would the same behavior occur if the harasser's significant other was watching? What would uh, someone in to act this way toward his wife, girlfriend, spouse, or significant other? Are both parties initiating and participating equally? And a lot of times when it comes to harassment and discrimination, it's usually one-sided. So what's appropriate action? You wanna make sure that you have a prompt and thorough investigation process. You're getting all the facts, not just one side, but both sides. You're reaching a conclusion and you're taking action to correct the situation. All right. You're looking at uh, the victim of uh, the consequences of the investigation. You're wanting to make sure that this person is fully understands what's going on, what could be the consequences, but not really, you don't have to talk about the penalty that could be imposed on this person if it's found out to be true. You're just keeping them informed on the processes you're going through. 
Most employers felt compared to err on the side of over disciplining employee because we wonder if we don't do it, how bad can it get? So those little simple things like that single picture joker email that used to slip through the cracks, now cities and counties are using progressive discipline and actually discipline the employee to terminate the employee based on these small things so it doesn't get bad and it doesn't get outrageous. All right, fell into some um, adequate um, inadequate remedies, fell into report the complaint because HR will make such a big deal about it and you'll have to, and you have a big project that you want to make sure both people are there and you need them to work on it. Let's not do that, okay? We need to make sure that this is squashed as soon as we know about it. Telling the com uh, complaint to work it out with the other person, don't do that. This is something that probably needs to be worked out internally with the whole department and the whole uh, HR and everybody, okay? Not between the person, two people. Bring them together in the office. Please don't do that. You've got to talk to them individually because then it becomes a blaming game and a lot of fussing and fighting and stuff. Please make sure you don't do that, okay? This is a time where you need to keep it separated and find out what the real problem is. All right, of course, the inadequate remedy is, is doing nothing because the person complaining doesn't want you to. They don't want to cause any trouble. Or they tell you, oh my goodness, um, I want you to keep this confidential. There's no such thing, unfortunately. Um, as you know, most cities and counties have these things called rumor mills, and by the time usually HR is finding out about this, it's already been all over the city or county. Everybody knows about it. So you keep it as confidential as you can until it goes to court, then it's out of your hands. And, but of course, this is gonna leak out, and you know it will, but you try to keep it as confidential as possible. Transferring the person who complained without request is a bad thing to do. Most attorneys say that, look, the person that complained, you need to leave them alone because it could be considered retaliation. So the person that has the claim filed against them might be the easiest person to move, or that might be the easiest person that you remove from the job completely and maybe and I suspend them with pay pending the investigation. That way it's easier to bring them back. Failing to follow up to see if a problem has stopped. So you think you've got it done, but you're not checking to make sure that there's been no other retaliation, no other discrimination or, or harassment to this person that submitted the claim in the first place. And we'll talk about that a little bit. Harassment laws have changed and expanded a little bit in the recent years, but unfortunately, lack of knowledge is no longer a defense when it comes to this. Employers must be proactive in preventing, discovering, and remedying all harassment that comes through the workplace as soon as they can. So as a supervisor, this is what you need to do. You got to meet with the complainant, report and document dates, times, and details, ensure cooperation with the investigation, ensure no reoccurrence or retaliation is going to happen. And you've got to support the discipline or the remedy when it comes down, whether you believe in it or not, because if you don't, your employees won't either. So you got to support that. So on the reporting document, you name the complainant, name the alleged harasser, the possible witnesses that you'll need to talk to, the date, time, and location of the alleged incident, description of the alleged incident, Everything needs to be in writing. As we say in HR, document, document, document. It's the most important thing when it comes to this stuff to make sure you have everything because people forget dates, times, and places all the time. The more you have in writing, the better off it's going to be. Ensure cooperation with the investigation. See, don't assume that just because it's in your department, you're the one that's going to conduct the investigation because nine times out of ten, you're not you're gonna get the first initial information and then give it to somebody else. And it's usually the HR department that comes in to investigate, or we even have some cities and counties that go to a third party administrator. That way, all they're looking at is the facts and making a judgment based off of that because they do not know anybody that's in the involved in the dispute, okay? You wanna make sure that all employees know that if they have something or know something, they need to come forward and let the investigation follow through its correct processes. 
Don't hold anything back. Ensure no re, uh, reoccurrence or retaliation. Take formal steps to eliminate and minimize contact between the two people and the uh, pending the investigation. Explain what could happen if they do. And I'll go ahead and tell you, it's natural instinct that if somebody has a claim submitted against them, they're going to go to that person and ask them, what did I do? What can I do to stop this? That's probably the worst thing they could do just because what could happen if it escalates? And we've actually seen you could be fired quicker for retaliation than the actual offense that you've been charged with. And even when it comes to co-workers who come and do some confrontation of the employee, I know Jim didn't do it. I'll go talk to this person and find out what's going on. That needs to stop also. The employee does not need to go in, in response to this they could be charged with retaliation also. Support the discipline or the remedy is critical to this anti-harassment policy. Like I said, lack of support, subordinates take cues from you and you're like, oh, all they're doing is they're getting rid of all the people that know they're doing what they need to do to follow the policy correctly and follow it in a timely manner that is efficient and effective across the board for everybody that comes through there and has that done to them. So that way the employees know what they're supposed to be doing. And the supervisors know, once they find out about it, what they're supposed to be doing. All right, so the definition according to EEOC in the course is unwelcome or unsolicited speech, conduct based specifically on those protected classes, and it creates an intimidating, a hostile or offensive work environment for the person and interferes with the work performance or otherwise adversely affects the employee's performance of the job. So this person doesn't feel comfortable anymore doing the job. And one example is this, we actually had a young lady that her supervisor would walk into her office and start massaging her shoulders. Now, think about that. That could be very offensive to some people. And what's so bad is that people walked by her office and saw this happening and they didn't do anything about it. So this young lady was felt so bad about what was going on that she started coming in early, two to three hours early, going to her office and locking the door so he couldn't get in. Now, all of a sudden, he's got a key and he unlocks the door and comes in. And she got to the point where she wasn't even coming to work. That right there is the type of stuff that needs to stop. It starts out small, but it escalates and builds. We've got to take care of it at the initial point. So couple of types of harassment, quid pro quo, Latin meaning phrase is this for that. So an ex it's an exchange of services, so to speak. The submission to or rejection of sexual attention is made implicitly or explicitly, depends on the vulgarity of the person. And even this little simple statement got a supervisor into trouble. This was a supervisor that had four ladies working for him. On a Friday afternoon, he calls the ladies into his office. He says, ladies, there's this raise. I have to give at least one of you. Who really wants it? I'll be at my lake house all weekend. Now, everybody's like, oh, my God, he, I can't believe he said that. But even to this day, he says, I didn't do anything wrong. We were just going to talk about the raise. The fact that he asked somebody to go and meet him at another location makes the assumption of what's going to happen at the lake house. Now, this can occur inside or outside of the workplace. So you got to be careful. And the best policy is this. You don't get your honey where you get your money. Definitely words to live by today. Now, there is a policy that a city or county can implement. It's actually called a no dating policy or a fraternization policy that says a supervisor subordinate should not be dating. If this happens, somebody could lose their job. And it's mostly going to be the supervisor that loses their job because that's the person that should know better. My personal opinion is it should be supervisor subordinate and subordinate subordinate, especially if they work on the same ship. And the reason I say that is this, if they fight at home, usually it's coming back to work. That's just my opinion, okay? Before you go and do something like that, make sure you talk to the attorneys of your city or county, make sure they agree. All right, hostile work environment is some type of speech or conduct. It usually deals with a protected class, but there has to be a frequency level there unless it's so severe and pervasive, so bad, like this situation. We had a gentleman who had a unique way of welcoming people to work. 
he would walk up behind you, take his hands, put into your pockets and move to the front of your body because he thought that was funny. Now, because that was so severe and pervasive that it only took one time, just like it would a, a, a quid pro quo, it only took one time and he had a lot of cases filed against him, okay? But usually when it comes to hostile work environment, there has to be a frequent middle there. And it has to be due to violating or protecting someone's protected class status. This can occur inside or outside the workplace also, and it could be verbal, nonverbal, or physical. Verbal side, we have comments, jokes, stories, not accepting no, and asking a person out on a date. Also, you got to be very careful if your city or county uses inmates because anything they do, you can be held liable for it too. So if they start referring or catcalling or making suggestive sounds to the opposite sex, then you, you can get into some trouble with sexual innuendos or whatever. You've got to make sure that you are protecting people both inside and outside. So not only do you protect employees from employees, but anybody else they come in contact with. And that can be very difficult throughout the day. Nonverbal. We have gestures, body movements, elevator eyes, no direct eye contact, suggestive visuals like your posters, your calendars, your pictures, your emails. And about emails, if you send an offensive email, it may not be offensive to the first person you send it to, but you don't know who's gonna, who else is going to receive that email. So you need to make sure that you're not the one initiating it. Please don't even be the one passing it around to other people, but really don't initiate it because it's unwanted attention. And people will see this as creating a hostile work environment. It could be as simple as that. Also winking. Now, don't read a lot into winking. Just because somebody winks at you doesn't mean anything. They could either have something in their eye or naturally they blink a lot when they talk. So don't read a lot into winking, but this could be something that, leads into a hostile work environment if it goes further through our frequency level. Physical environment like hugs, kisses, patting, touching. All right, hugs. Georgia is a real big hugging state. We always have been and we always will be. That's how we tell each other hello, goodbye, nice to see you, whatever. The only thing I need to tell you about this, if a person tells you, please don't do this to me, don't hug in front of me, don't, you know, don't, don't touch me, just don't do it. That's the easiest thing to do, okay? Also, when it comes to physical uh, side of it, impeding or blocking someone's movement, that could be considered a hostile work environment, especially when that person might rub up against somebody else un unintentionally, but it could happen. So how much is too much? Quid pro quo is usually one time, one time only, like I said, hostile work environment is usually, like I said, the frequency level, depending on the severity of it. Usually there's a pattern behind it, all right, unless it gets so bad. So who can be the harasser? Guess what? Anybody, elected officials, managers, supervisors, co-workers, visitors, salespeople, delivery people, or even a non-employed. So like I said, there's a lot of people that you have to protect your employees from. And as a supervisor, you got to keep your eyes and ears open because it could be the one that you least expect is the one that's being harassed or the one that is harassing somebody. Who can complain? Just about anybody too. Co-workers, salesmen, males and females, visitors, salespeople, delivery people. It could be directly or indirectly. And what I'm saying here is this, just because a person is not involved in the interaction, let's say I'm talking to somebody and we're talking about what happened over the weekend and we got a little graphic with it, but somebody that was sitting over here beside us said, wait a minute, that's a little bit offensive to me because of what they're saying. That's unintended victim because you were not talking to them, but it affects them. So that's why you have to be so careful because it's anybody that could be around that could be affected by what's going on. So elements of an effective discrimination and harassment prevention plan. It needs to be in writing in your policy manual. It needs to define harassment discrimination, declare what is intolerable, have that formal specific complaint reporting system, provide training to everybody, have ensure that prompt and complete investigation, of course, prompt corrective action and discipline, 
and include a formal retaliation policy. And they're actually saying that needs to be separated. So it needs to be a separate policy, of course. So we got a little scenario that we'll talk about. So a longtime battalion chief for municipal fire department, for decades, he's employed a management style that promotes a family atmosphere at the fire station he oversees, and he casts himself as a firefighter father and other firefighters as brothers and sisters. In keeping with this Mandarin approach, he often hugs the firefighters, both male and female, at various points throughout the shift. Tanya, a recent transfer firefighter who never previously worked under Roy's command, she's not a hugger and consistently pushes Roy away when he attempts to hug her. He is persisting in telling Tanya, you just need to understand we're like a family here. Family members hug each other, so you might as well go ahead and do it. Tanya files a sex harassment complaint with the city HR director and subsequently holds a meeting with the city manager, the fire chief, and Roy. Roy is told to stop hugging everyone. He responds by saying, I consider these firefighters to be my sons and daughters, and I've been hugging them for over 30 years, and I'm too old to stop now, so you might as well go ahead and fire them. In aspiration, the city manager asks, well, Roy, can't you at least stop hugging the women? He agrees to the compromise. From that point forward, he only hugs male firefighters. Whenever a female firefighter attempts to hug him, he pulls away and says, nope, sorry, women don't get hugs anymore. After several weeks of this, Sarah, a firefighter signed to one of Roy's station, files a grievance with HR alleging to Roy that Roy is discriminating against her and the other female firefighters by withholding hugs from them. Now, it's kind of, that's kind of a danged if you do, danged if you don't situation. That's why it's so important to make sure that you're doing the right stuff. Now, since Roy hugged both male and female subordinates, was Tanya's complaint invalid? And it wasn't because actually not only did she say to stop, but she actually pushed him away multiple times. So the fact that he was still grabbing her could be considered assault. And that's a totally different situation then. But you've got to be careful with that because she asked him to stop. They should have stopped automatically. All right, since Roy would only hug male subordinates after Tanya's complaint, was Sarah's discrimination complaint invalid? And unfortunately, it still wasn't invalid because he was actually going against a protected class of people by not giving them hugs. But I don't think he's going to be on the hook for this because the person that actually told him not to do this was the city manager. He actually gave him a direct order that says, please do not do this to the women on ship. So he was following the direct order. So it's probably not going to be him that's that's having any problems. I think it's going to go against the city manager. The city had known for years that Roy hugged all of his employees where his rights violated when he was instructed to stop. And of course, they were not. You've got to remember, what was done 20, 30, 40 years ago can't be done today. So as soon as you find out that something shouldn't be done anymore, you either have to change with the times or you may have to be removed. And I hate to say that, but that's sometimes what the situation will call for. Should the city have handled Tanya's complaint differently? And of course they should have, by the simple fact of this. As soon as Roy said, I've been hugging these people for over 40 years and I'm too old to stop now. You might as well go ahead and fire me. Have the paper sitting right there and probably go ahead and give it to him and say, I'm sorry, we're going to have to let you go. Because you know that there's an issue. You've got to take care of that issue or it's negligence. Okay. So also, let's just say the fact that uh, he goes, okay. I'll stop hugging everybody, but still he's in that bad situation because now he's not hugging females and now it's just, it's a discrimination complaint. So it's kind of dang if you do, dang if you don't, like I said. So you got to make sure that everybody's being protected when it comes to this. It comes to the simple fact that if that, if the fire chief would have just not hugged anybody or the battalion chief wouldn't have hugged anyone, he would have been okay, or maybe even, even if he would have stopped hugging Tanya, that would have stopped it. The fact that he did not stop it is a problem. Then also you got to think about this. So now Roy's fired. Now he is a 30-year veteran, and there's a, probably a lot of people that know him, like him, 
And all of a sudden they find out that the reason he was terminated was because he wasn't, he didn't, he hugged somebody that didn't want him to hug him and they got, and Tanya got him fired. Now, I don't know about you, but I think there's going to be a lot of retaliation from the other divisions or even other stations of the fire department. That's just me, maybe, but it could happen. So not only now, just because Roy is gone, the case is not over. You have to make sure you're going back periodically to the other stations to make sure Tanya is not being discriminated, harassed, or retaliated against. And this is something that's not weeks, not months. It could take years for this to happen. But let's say this happened. Tanya finally says, you know what? I, I just can't handle this anymore. So you know what? I quit. Now, even though she's quit, you know there's still a situation. Okay? You have to make sure you still handle the situation because she might be the one that complained, but there could be other people that don't like it also. And finally, they know that they can complain about it and, and feel like they should be able to do that because she was able to do that. Okay? It could open up a door. So just because Roy's gone, Tanya says, just drop everything. It doesn't mean it's over. But let's say everything going about its business. Uh, Roy finally stops hugging everybody. And about three months later, fire chief from another county, another city, calls over. And this happens all the time. It happens with police department, sheriff's office, public works department, fire departments. They'll have somebody call over to the station and find out what type of person this, this employee was. So the fire chief picks up the phone and says, uh, yes, I'm fire chief so-and-so from city or county so-and-so. Uh, what can you tell me about Tanya? She's applying to be a firefighter here at my station. And a lot of times, whoever picks up the phone may say something that's legitimate but could get us into a lot of trouble. And we've heard the things like, oh, please don't hug her. Oh, she she got so and so fired. Well, yes, that's all true, but that could come back and she can sue them personally for preventing her from getting another job. So the best thing I tell everybody and supervisors need to make sure they tell their employees too that if they answer the phone and there's a question about somebody's employment, the best people to talk to them is the HR department. OK, so when that happens to so say, hold on one second, let me get you in contact with our HR department. They can answer any questions that you have about this employee. Now, if it gets to the HR department, there's only certain things that the HR department is going to answer anyway. They're going to say pretty much, well, what the title of the person was, when this person started and when they stopped. That's probably about it. And now even attorneys for different cities and counties argue with the question of, would you rehire this person? And the reason is, is how you respond to it. Someone calls me and says, would you rehire Tanya? And I go, what am I saying that I would not rehire her? Maybe not because of her work ethic, just because of what happened and everything like that. It's just not, not comparable to do something like that. But you're still putting that out there that Tanya may be an issue and you can't do that. So a lot of cities and counties debate on whether they should ask that question or not. So you want to make sure that you protect all employees. As a supervisor, you know the ins and outs of the harassment policy to be able to answer any questions they have and know what to do if you ever have that come before you. Don't just say, oh, we'll take care of it later because that's not going to be right. That's not going to that's not going to be good. The minute you find out about it as a supervisor, you have an obligation to take it forward and take care of the problem as soon as possible. Hey, Chris. Yes. I have a question here. Okay. Would, would you go into age discrimination, discrimination a little bit more? Talk a little bit about more about age discrimination. Uh, age discrimination is it's it doesn't start until the age of forty. So anybody forty years or over is in the protected class, whether it's male, female, it doesn't matter. Um, anybody younger is not in that um, it's not in the age group and they're not protected under federal law. I'm not real sure exactly what they're looking for on that one. Um, and there's no limit 
to the age of the person after 40. It could be up to 70, it could be up to 80, because we do have some employees that are 60s, 70s, and sometimes 80 years of age still working for us. You got to make sure that if somebody like that is working for you, you're not making them feel inferior about their age and doing the job. So you can't say, when are you going to retire? Uh, retirement's right around the corner. Are you going to do it this time? You need to leave them alone and let them make the decision based on what they want to do and what their qualifications are. Very good. What about anybody else? Does anybody else have any questions? This is where your part to participate. Any other questions? What about age jokes? Can you make no, fun of somebody? No, 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 no. <laughs> Don't do that either. Like I said, if it has to do with a protected class, the best thing to do is don't do it. You always ask yourself, would my family like me doing this? Or would it, Would you like to be in the paper asking that same question to somebody? So here's a follow-up to the age uh, question. I was wondering about the scenario when he said Tony was going to be let go because he wouldn't stop hugging uh, and not – in the in not in that time anymore it it is like referring to his age no what it is is that as times change people have to change so maybe the fact that hugging wasn't a big issue now but now it is just because somebody has brought that to the attention of the people you've got to make sure that that is protected for all employees so if one person brings it to the attention times and things have to change no matter what the person's age is, you've got to roll and change with the times. So just before I go into the, another question, just for everybody's sake, uh, I will be sending out the presentation along with the recording to all those that registered for this particular course. Um, and that actually sending out at the same time, all those that registered for the employee version of this course. Uh, so you'll be receiving that. Um, another question, well, comment based on the age joke. I get teased that I need to be careful so I don't break a hip. Yeah. that's That could lead into a hostile work environment if it relates to your age. Oh, you're so old that your bones are brittle or something like that. The best thing to do is, is like I said, don't do stuff like that. Would you want to say that to a loved one? If you wouldn't want to say it to a loved one, why would you want to say it to someone else that you're working with? I know it might be funny. Cities and counties are like big families and we like to pick on each other. But sometimes this is where we get into the problems of picking on each other beyond what we should be able to do. You got to remember there is a distinction between an employee and a family member. But again, the, I think, and tell me if I'm wrong, Chris, if you're offended by those comments, then you should probably bring it up to the person that's making those comments and yes. or to the per HR person so that they yes. can address it. And most policies actually say if somebody's being offensive to you, that you um, confront them and ask them to stop. Now, unfortunately, everybody can't do that because some people are timid, they don't want to rock the boat, or maybe they've known the person for so long they don't want to get them into trouble. But that's why there's that available complaint reporting system is there, so you can contact your HR department and let them know there's an issue. And unfortunately, EOC does not require you to ask the person to stop. It's a best practice to ask them to stop because nine times out of ten, if you ask somebody to stop, they're going to stop. Unfortunately, the reason we have policies is because that one person wouldn't stop. So, any other questions? Well, Chris, thank you so very much. Great job. Great presentation to all those that you're listening. Again, as I said, okay, here's another question that comes up. Are okay. case numbers on this on the rise or decline in the past few years? They're actually on the decline when it comes to physically grabbing somebody or asking them for sexual favors. 
but they're on the incline of comments that are being done to protect the classes, especially when it comes to the sexual orientation thing, the, the class that, that just was included, that's a big one. So like I said, you've got to be very careful on what you're saying and doing around people because it could be that person that you're not really talking to, they're just around you that hears this, that finds it offensive. So again, just from a claims perspective within Gurma specifically, so uh, both uh, within GMA, there was a, a tremendous amount of harassment claims probably in the early 2000s, uh, and those have dropped pretty uh, pretty large. Although we still get, yeah. we still get surprisingly, we still get claims. We just had uh, one. Uh, one some massive claims from one specific uh, city from the police department that was an issue. So it usually happens with one specific department based on different things going on. So we still have them out there, and uh, I think it has gotten better overall. I think people are more aware of uh, inappropriate behavior, but on the same respect, people are still acting very, very poorly, um, especially uh, when they feel they have the power to do so. Definitely. So, um, I'm going to go on to the next one. Best employees keep making harassment claims by other employees. Adjustments are made, but new issues keep arising. How to deal with the, the employee who is looking uh, for this to use a, as a gotcha method to deal with an employee? Okay. Unfortunately, as you know, uh, anybody can submit a claim because it's based on the perception of the person and we do have employees out there that like to do this just because they're trying to get back at a person unfortunately eoc says we cannot discipline them when it comes to the harassment section of our our, our policy because it, it creates an, a chilling effect and the person that actually has a legitimate claim won't come forward so you have to discipline them on another aspect of the policy, uh, like lying on their oath or something like that, or violating um, another law or something. But as far as like disciplining them under the harassment section, EOC doesn't want that to happen. So yes, there are people, and I always tell everybody this, if you want to have, if, if, you, if you submit a claim against somebody, it'll change their life forever because even though they're found innocent, in the investigation they're still guilty out there in the public because that's just how everything usually goes and it does change your life so i usually tell them this if you are that unhappy with your job and your your co-workers and your boss the best thing i can tell you to do is please just find another job because you're creating more of a liability situation than anything else Let's see if there are any other questions out there. Thanks. I think that answered that. Well, with that being said, Chris, thanks again. Really appreciate it. Thank Everyone you. else, again, as I said, I will be sending out the presentation along with the recording um, sometime in the near future. If you have any questions or comments, please let me know uh, in the interim. If not, you guys all have a great day. And remember, go dogs. Oh, we got one more question. Would sure. social media be included as a category in harassment? Yes, it will. Um, unfortunately, social media, they've had so many back and forwards when it when it comes to what's what's legitimately uh, offensive or something like that. Um, so anything that you post on your your email or internet or something like that, especially if anybody can see it, could get you into trouble. Now a lot of people say, well, this is my own personal uh, Facebook page nobody has permission to get on there but we've seen it to where people have been terminated by what they put on their Facebook page and cities and counties actually have policies that you're not gonna you're not supposed to say anything that's detrimental about a city or county that you work for and you're not supposed to have anything on that shows who you work for and in a negative light uh, so it, like I said, it depends on the court system and everything, and it's been changing back and forth, and nobody's had a set standard yet, but the fact of you can't say anything negative about your, your city or county, that could cause them some, some harm. Um, 
so yeah, social media is out there and a lot of people will use it as a platform. You just have to be very careful with what's going on. Um, and like I said, it, if it goes to court, that's when we find out the do's and don'ts. But like I said, even in courts, they've actually ruled on something, changed it and ruled the other way and then changed it again and ruled back the same way. So I'm not even sure if they're really understanding what they need to do yet. Very good. Right. Okay. So with that said, I will say goodbye to everyone. Uh, thanks. Go dogs. Go Braves. Very good. And uh, we will let everybody go. Uh, have a great rest of the day. We'll talk to you later. Bye.